everyone. Welcome to the um, final session for the day. Um, I'd like to introduce to you, we have Eduardo Silva from Costa Rica, and he's talking on the advanced stream processing on the edge. Let's uh, make him welcome. Hello. Thanks for coming. This is the last session of the day. So we'll try to make it more active, this session. So my name is Eduardo. I work for ARM. And since a couple of years, we have been creating different open source tools and ecosystem to manage data or move data from one place to another. And the whole purpose of this kind of data management is that you should be able to extract value from that data. But the main problem is that data come from different places at different rates, different formats. And it's ended up being a mess if you don't know how to do it right. And I think that everybody who operates any kind of system needs to solve logging and try to do some analysis from some level. Okay? So logging in general is all about data. But the whole point of data that, as I said, in our system, can data come from the operating system, the system services, the user space applications, hardware, sensors, or anything. Okay? So if we got data, we should be able to extract value. If we don't extract value, it's, it's worthless, right? So it will, it will not work. That's why we need databases or places where we can concentrate the data and try to get the proper uh, insight from that. And the way that this works is like we centralize all our data in a database, that is the common schema, and after that we can extract value. And we say that we need to centralize the data because data comes from multiple places. And what are the challenges here? Is that, as I said at the beginning, data comes from different sources. We can have, for example, a data coming from the network protocol, like from firewalls, send UDP packets from the file system, journal D, or anything that is working in our system generates some kind of data. And got that information is really important. And the common workflow is like we have some hardware or software generating some event or log, then this gets centralized in a database, and then we can do analysis. And these are the kind of challenges that we start facing, because if we have more data, we need more computing power, we need more network bandwidth, and things get expensive in computing times. And if you want to get kind of real-time results, real-time, I'm not talking about embedded real-time, <laughs> real-time, I mean milliseconds or a second, things will get delayed because when your data gets centralized in a database, likely you are getting some indexing and your data will be available after a couple of seconds. But if you're ingesting, I don't know, 500,000 records per second, it will take more time. And that's how, what the way it works, okay? But sometimes we can do it a little bit better. And one of the challenges too in, in logging is that all the data comes in different formats. Maybe if you look at the Apache logs, you can understand it. You can say, oh, the first field that we have there is like a timestamp, the, later we have the HTTP method, the URI, which is the resource, the protocol version, the return status code, and how many bytes the server replied back to the client. That's what we understand. But for the computer, all of this example is just an array of bytes. There's no sense of a structure. So if the data doesn't have a structure, it's really hard to do the right processing to extract the right value. This is what ideally what we want, to create a structure for our data, right? And the way to perform this is that we need specialized tools for that. We cannot let every developer in the world apply a structure for their own applications or for their own services. Most of companies fail at that. But what they do is like, from a centralizing perspective where they're processing all this information, they create rules and policies on how the data will be processed so we can put some kind of a structure on it. And before we can analyze our data to extract the value, we need to collect it from different sources. We need to convert from a structured version, like this, to a structured version. 
Sometimes we need to do some kind of data enrichment. We, have to want, we want to add some metadata. And sometimes we want to drop older events that are not relevant. For example, we don't want to get, we don't want to centralize all the information that comes from a, a debug, a service that enables debug. Maybe it's, it's writing hundreds of lines per second, and we don't need that. And then we need a way to take all this information that we collected with Transformer and deliver it to a central place, like a database or a cloud service, so we can do the proper analysis. And this is where Fluentbit comes in. Uh, Fluentbit is an open source project which is part of the FluentD ecosystem. Maybe if you are familiar with Kubernetes or the cloud native uh, space, there are many projects to solve different problems. One of them is FluentD and Fluentbit is under its umbrella. Fluentbit uh, it started like in 2015 and originally this project born to solve all the login problems for embedded Linux. But at that moment, people from the embedded space, they always try to solve the things in different ways because they have different kind of data, different kind of system. And, but people from the cloud space on the other side, they said, hey, we would like to have something like Fluentbit. One is because it's open source it's fully written in C language, and it was originally decided, or sorry, designed to consume low memory and CPU footprint. And also, it has a lot of plugins where you can use to collect data from different places to transfer the data in different ways and send the data to different destinations and with built-in security. Normally, when you play with all this data management stuff or data pipeline, you have this kind of model where on the left you have your input, what is your input source of data, then you have your parser section when you try to convert data from an unstructured way to a structured way, then you have a filter where you can enrich your data with metadata or just drop records, then a kind of buffer system because you want to have some real reliability when you're going to roll the data out. Because for example, if you're going to send the data to output one, and output one, I don't know, the network is down, are you going to lose your data? No, you don't want to do, lose your data. You would like to have some kind of buffering mechanism and let your pipeline retry and to send that information out. Okay, and I'm going to do a, a couple of quick demos on how this operates because all of this talk is about how to extract value from data, but this is all about logging too. Okay, so in my first demo, here I have a configuration file for, oops, for Fluentbit, which basically we decide, define a service that they flush data every second, the log level is information, and we define a parser file because we can register many parsers on how to handle the data. Then we have an input site of data, an input will be the source. We're going to use the plugin tail, which is to follow a log files from the file system. And then we have an output section, which means where this data is going to be routed out. This is very simplified because you can create routing rules and so on. And the output here will be like Elasticsearch uh, database. Are you familiar with Elasticsearch? Yeah, most of you, perfect. So the first thing that we're going to do is to delete our database, but don't do this at home. This command is very dangerous. I cannot believe that a database offered that, right? Yeah, I wipe all the database. And I'm going to restart um, the Kibana service so it gets a, a fresh start. So in the first example, what I want to do is to take a couple of uh, Apache log records like this, which doesn't have a structure, and just insert them into the database so we can do some analysis. Okay, and we're going to use our configuration file that I just described. Oops, there we go. And it just should insert the data. We can query the database here. 
So we can get some indices information. Okay, we will see that the, the 100 lines from the log file from here, from the Apache log, were ingested on this index. Okay, database, Elastic has the index concept where you store the documents. And we have done 100 documents. And now how these documents looks like. Let's go to Kibana, which is our the graphical tool to query the Elasticsearch information. First of all, I need to create some patterns. So give the index logs dash. I think that should be okay. And define the timestamp field. Okay, now it's querying the information. Let me dismiss here. Perfect. So here, what we have is like every record that we ingested into the database. So we went through the phase of collect data from the file system and just delivered that straight away to the database. So the log processor in this case, Fluent Bit, knows how to convert the payload for the right services that it's talking to. But this is an interesting thing. If you go here, for example, for the JSON document, you will see that the log message is just an array of bytes. There's no structure. So if you want, for example, to perform some queries here in the search interface, you want to say everything that log contains 500, which 500 will be a status error for and this internal server error for HTTP servers, you're going to get all the records that has that information. Like this, 500, 500, 500. But sometimes, if we ha I have the same 500 in a different position, I'm going to get some false positive. And the thing is that maybe I'm just parsing 100 of records, but if I have thousands of them, perform that simple query will be really expensive in computing time because I'm parsing the whole data. So what can I do as a better way to improve that scenario? For example, here in the configuration, I can apply a parser. And I can say, okay, for all that data that you're going to read from that log file, you're going to apply the parser called Apache. And the parsers are quite simple. For example, well, simply meaning that you write it once, you're not going to remember. For example, for Apache, we use a regular expression, which basically say, based on this pattern, group the results and create some keys and values. So you just write this once and that's it. So our Fluent Bit configuration, now it's using the parser for the data that is consuming. So if I run this again, and I query my logs, okay, you will see we that we have a new index here because when we apply the parser, the parser understood that every record has a timestamp. And now it's respecting that timestamp and is creating a new index with the right information. And if we go here, and now we can do something like this. Show me all the records that code equals 500. Or maybe, oh, but the data comes from the last year, so I need to change here my, the year that I'm, go, I'm looking for, the last year, yeah. There we go. So as you can see, all my logs now has a structure. And when I'm querying the data, I'm just querying a specific fields from the original records. If we go to the, for example, the JSON payload, Look at this. Here we have different fields for the data that we just transformed and we just ingested. So this is what we mean, this is a structured login. And this is the way that we should handle it. Okay? And now getting back to the presentation. When we get data, a simple message, for example, if you think about syslog or containers, this message 
is appended in a log stream, it said, okay, this message is coming also from a place, which is a stream. But also, every message is created at some point. So a simple message gets a lot of metadata. And if you're running in, for example, Kubernetes, where you have the concept of pod, namespace, and other things, your data needs to be filtered and enriched with more data like this. So in Kubernetes, a simple message that generate that message, will get a stream, the Kubernetes, the host, pod name, and so on. And this is really important, because when you have this information, you can perform the right queries. And if you think about a Kubernetes cluster, likely you have no less than three nodes, and maybe every node running 50, 100 pods, which every pod could be a, an application that could, could be replicated in your cluster. So be able to centralize all this information with a structure is really important to gather the value from that data. In technical terms, when an application generates this event, which is called also a record, what it does is that it creates a, a touch a timestamp, the message, but what we do internally for optimization is to serialize this data in a binary format. What you see in the output maybe looks like JSON, but internally we use message pack, which is like a kind of binary JSON. And FluentBit is the program that takes care of that process. Internally, when the data from the left side is being generated, we tag the data. We can say all this data that is coming from these log files, please attach a tag, for example, Apache Bihos one and because you can listen from data from multiple places at the same time, and you can say that for the other kind of data, for example, please attach the tag syslog. Then this data goes to the storage phase, go to the router, and then internally it said, hey, we can create matching rules. So for everything that starts with Apache, that something, please send it to output plugin one. Uh, everything that matches syslog, send it to output plugin two. And why this is important? Because sometimes you want to send your data for long-term retention, right? If you want to have long-term retention, maybe you will have, I don't know, Hadoop or Splunk or anything like that. And if you want to have something from the last weeks because you want to perform real-time queries, maybe you will use Elasticsearch. So that's why sometimes you split uh, where your data is going. In Kubernetes, if you're familiar with the concept of a daemon set, uh, FluentBit is deployed as a daemon set, which is a pod that runs on every node. And basically, this specific pod gets access to the node logs, so it reads all the container logs, it talks to the API server, so it's able to retrieve all the metadata. And after they retrieve the metadata, you can send the data out to all your places like Elasticsearch, AWS, or any kind of service that you're using locally or remotely. And how do we connect the dots here? One thing is data, the other is logging, and we have the concept of stream processing. Stream processing is the ability to perform data processing while the data is still in motion. So meaning I can do something with the data before this data hits the file system, before it hits the indexing, the database phase. And why this is important? Because we can collect real time or generate reports based on results in kind of real time responses. So for example, normally the records are emitted by application. The events get structured and then they group by a timestamp and a message. This, for example, is a simple sensor information where the temperature marked 53 grades, and we have a timestamp. And we can consider that one of them is the key and the other is the value. But when the data is flowing, and we are applying all this kind of filtering and converting the data, all of them has a different uh, schema. No, a different structure because this is a schemaless. There's not like a fixed schema because every data is different. So with stream processing, we aim to do fast data processing. We aim to perform all of this in memory. There's no tables, there's no database, and there's no indexing. So how this works? Basically, what 
in general, if you deploy a, any kind of a stream processor tool, basically you take the data from the software, the events get into the stream processor, and you get real-time analysis, and then maybe you ship the data out to the database. Okay? Pero, but in order to perform stream processing, you need to be able to select specific queries, you need to be able to filter your data and expose some kind of language so you can query your data, but doing all in memory. Usually you do this with a SQL or, for example, if you're using Kafka, KSQL, or any kind of uh, language. The normal thing, the normal uh, scenarios works like you have the edge where the data is being generated, and normally what you do is to send all this data to the cloud, where you do stream processing, long-term storage, and all those kind of things. But how do we mix this concept of logging and stream processing and we improve this? Because our goal is to get faster data insights. So if we have this model, we thought, hey, why we cannot put all this stream processing stuff on the edge, not in the cloud? And at the beginning you said it's really complex because I don't want to deploy my Java application on the edge. The edge can be a Raspberry Pi, an embedded Linux device, or a gateway. But if you have the right tool, we, can, we said why we don't improve the log processor and we give it stream processing capabilities. So a way to query your data and generate actions based on your data. And the goal of stream processing is to offload computation. So, for example, if you're reading data from sensors and you get 10, 10 samples per second, after one, you, don't want, you don't want to send all this data out to the cloud. You would like to maybe do some math, some calculation on the edge, and just send the results. And also, this comes with a, a security benefit because you are not sending out all your data, just the relevant results that will not be affected by security threats. And all of this stream processing feature that I'm talking about is fully integrated in FluEmbed. So you said, how do we create a, a SQL stuff in FluEmbed? Well, it's part of the code. It was implemented with Flex Bison. And every time that we filter the data, after that, it hits the stream processor. And if you're familiar with Kafka and KSQL, we try to replicate the same concept. So we have every input source of data for us becomes a stream. And with that stream that already has a structure, you have the key names. So you can, you can select these keys, you can group by them, on do, or do any kind of things with that. The stream processor works just after the filter when it hits the storage. So in the stream processor, get not a copy, but the same memory reference from the data that is flowing. And if you define some roles, the results can be re-ingested back into the data pipeline. So you can have your old data pipeline working, sending data, or maybe just get your data hit a stream processor, perform some queries, and just send out the results. Uh, on this, we support aggregation functions, time functions, and we are getting also in machine learning. We are going to extend all this stream processor so you can create your own, uh, for example, time series functions, so, which is basically math function that says for data that fits on, on this range, uh, matches or not matches, and based on that, you can do a lot of things. For example, with time series forecasting, based on math, you can say, hey, my data in the last minute look like this. In the next minute, I know that will look like this. And maybe in the next minute, I'm going to get an alert, or maybe I'm going to get an anomaly. It depends on your data. It depends on the rules that you create. So this is not just about selecting keys and just create a new stream. It's about also generating alerts and detect anomalies. Uh, in this example that I'm going to show you now, uh, when I started the presentation, if I'm not wrong, I started uh, the service in FluentBit with this stream. Basically, what we are saying is create a stream called results with a tag. Do you remember that we put tags on the records? with the result from the query, select the average value of CPU. I'm going to show you what is CPU P. From the stream CPU, window tumbling 60 seconds. So I created a window of one minute. And for all the CPU samples, 
I'm measuring the CPU, the CPU usage from my computer. Every 60 seconds, I'm just going to deliver the results, the average of that. I'm not delivering 60 samples, just one. Let me see if this one, yeah. I'm going to show you how this data works. Uh, this, in, this looks, um, this data gets integrated. For this example, I choose it to put the data into InfluxDB and running also InfluxDB here locally, which is another database for metrics, measurements, and is really good. Okay, so this is when I started the presentation. This is how the CPU has been working on my computer. But right now, you can consider that this is the aggregation the data got indexed, got in my computer. And if you want to know when my data hit a certain interval or calculate that, means that I need to wait that the old data gets inserted first into the database so then I can run the proper queries. But with the stream processing, we can do things uh, better than this, not better, differently, which means I'm going to do the data calculation on the edge or not on the cloud. This could be the, like the cloud. So in demo three, what I did was the following. I'm going to show you the stream first. The streams or the SQL queries are composed in a configuration file. This is the same query that I just showed in the slide, okay? And in my configuration, I'd say the following. I loaded the stream configuration file. I load the CPU input plugin. Fluentbit is not just to collect data from files. You can get, you have plugins to get metrics from CPU, memory, disk, I.O., anything. And what I did is to send all the data that matches something to a Slack. This sounds silly, but many people use a Slack for alerting. So what I did basically with this webhook, I'm going to delete it after the, the talk, mean that for all the results of the query, I'm sending messages to the project Slack that is here. So every minute we get a new sample and we can see here how the data the percentage of a CPU, the average percent of CPU in the last minute. So uh, here I have like, I don't know, 50 samples, no, 30 samples because I've been talking for 30 minutes. So what is really important and interesting on this is that you can take your data from multiple places, you can transfer the data and take actions with that data. And there's no other tool in the market that do this, and neither open source. So I would say that is one of the first projects that is implementing these kind of techniques. And our goal is to continue extending all the machine learning and plugins so you can extend your own queries. Actually, Fluentbit also support a Lua scripting so you can create your own filters in Lua. So we aim also to implement which is called UDF, user defining function for the stream processor in Lua. So which will be a way to create more simple ways or take math decisions on your data. Okay, um, I think that we have to, a few minutes, so before the questions, maybe we can talk a little bit about the internals, because I got this question uh, yesterday, I was talking in the dinner, and I, I said, hey, how Fluentbit, as a, a small service in C, is able to process all the data? And from technical terms, just in two minutes, I'm going to explain this. We have a main event loop, which basically synchronize how, where, so we have a scheduler that talks to the one main event loop and tells the input plugins when to collect data, when to filter, and when it has to ship the data out. And one of the problems that we got when sending data out to databases, and since we have support Elasticsearch, InfluxDB, like 10, 10 different outputs, and most of them relies on network I.O., and if you think how we can improve that, because most of the, the problems with C or the 
event-driven programming, people try to implement things with callbacks. And sometimes that is a mess. And there are new paradigms with, uh, in, well, in Golang, then Rust, I think that they are trying to implement and how to defer or how to suspend or how to implement kind of coroutines in C. All these common tasks that we have when you are going to ship the data out to a database, you basically create a TCP connection, you convert the data, write the data over the network, wait for a response, and that's it. But the lines that we have in red are blocking operations, likely are blocking. So if you're going to write something, you're going to create a TCP connection and wait until that TCP connection is established. But it's not waiting. Actually, the kernel, you just, the kernel blocks you and just return you back when it's ready. So we said, why we cannot improve that and use asynchronous operations with coroutines? So what we did, for example, this is a abstract of the Elasticsearch plugin. On line eight, when we have the upstream connection get, what it does internally is create the TCP connection, get the socket, and then return. But for every operation that it talks to the kernel to a syscall, it just instructs to do something, suspend, get back to the ML loop, do a lot of work, and at some point the kernel is going not notifies us back, hey, the connection is ready or the connection failed. And with the ML loop trap that events is going to resume at that point. So here you see like a blocking code in general, but internally, with our own API, we are doing a lot of I.O. with uh, coroutines and with the event loop. And the same thing happens on line 21. So when we chip the data out, we're going to write the data to over the socket. We just write per chunks, right? And we have some synchronization between the scheduler, the writer internally, and we just let uh, the scheduler return you back once the data has been shipped in total. Because when you're doing with a lot of network I.O., you can get many errors. It's really easy to mess up things. Because of line eight, for example, I got connected. But in the time frame that I get to line 21, maybe the connection got broken. Or maybe when I'm writing data, my connection drops. And that is a mess. How do you recover from that state? And that's why we implemented this mechanism so people can get rid of all of this problem and move properly. And plugins has a lot uh, this logic of a try. What I said at the beginning, if I got a problem trying to send some data, the plugin can, say to the, can tell to the engine, hey, I got some problem, please retry. And based on the, on the configuration, you can retry many times as if one, you can have the buffer in the memory or in the file system, and you have your own retry logic. We have a lot of internal helpers and we have connectivity for Kafka, Google Cloud, AWS now, and so on. We, there are around 50 plugins and growing. All of them written in C language. And as I said minutes ago, you can write your own functions in Lua. So this will be a, a Lua function to replace some value. You create a new record, a new appends a number, and old, you just append the old value of your record and just return that. And that's going to overwrite the original record. And it's pretty fast. If you like to play with monitoring or with Prometheus, we have a full integration with Prometheus, so you can monitor all your pipeline, how your data is flowing from the input section, from the filters, and from the outputs. So we aim that every component of FluentBit expose uh, some metrics over HTTP. And community updates, we got like 120 contributors around the globe. And just in 2019, we got 62 million deployments. Most of them comes from Kubernetes, Docker. So that's the only metric that we have, right? We don't put metering on the project, but we try to see how many people uh, get the Docker images, how many packages, and so on. So this is, uh, well, really good. If you have some questions, Yeah, we can take questions. Thank you, Thank you for the talk. Uh, I've got two practical questions. Uh, sure. First is, how, what about performance? How great it for the CPU and how much memory it costs to hold all, all functionality? Okay, performance question in general are always a bit, could be a bit tricky because here we are in logging. 
logging is expensive by nature. We are always dealing with text messages, right? So it's not the same to get two records than 100 per second, okay? So in performance, I would say that it's really good and really fast because to be just a single thread, I think that's able, it's able to switch and move the things really fast. Now, uh, for example, one of the problems that people face with all log processor is back pressure, meaning that, for example, you are ingesting, you are consuming too much data, but your ability to dispatch data is slower than your ability to consume. So at some point, you get struggled, your memory goes up, and how you handle that scenario. From that pers uh, performance perspective, we provide mechanism to control that at a memory level. Say, for example, if you are consuming data from a log file, you know that your log file can be your buffer, your backup. So you can specify, please, uh, this tail section cannot consume more than 10 megabytes of data. So you're going to consume until 10 megabytes, and it's not going to consume more until that data gets flushed. Um, as more filters you add, of course, it's going to compute more data, will become more expensive. But in performance, I think that uh, it's really fast, five, six times faster than FluentD, what we cannot compare with Logstash. This was designed for performance for low memory and CPU footprint. But always in logging, it's a matter of setup. Because if you don't put a mechanism for back pressure, for back pressure, and you're getting thousands of records, and you cannot flush that data, your memory will go up, your CPU will go up, and you're going to say, hey, this is not performance. But the problem can be on any place. But in general, we have really good uh, feedback. Uh, well, it's widely used by a lot of people, a lot of companies. More questions? Hi, just a quick one about the implementation of your own kind of um, async stuff. So that still just holds on to the thread. So you're still occupying the thread, and then but you just kind of hold on some primitive, and then the event loop wakes it back up when the network is ready? Yeah, it's just one thread. Yeah. So what we do, for example, most of the intensive work is when you are, I don't know, modifying the data in memory. But the, most of the waiting time is when you're going to write to the network, you want to perform a connection. So what we do is to, for example, asynchronous socket, uh, on technical terms, you, we perform the connection, that returns right away because it's asynchronous, and from that moment, we suspend execution, and we register that file descriptor until the kernel notify the evil loop that something changed. At that point, we resume. But during that window of time, we consume more data, we transfer more data, so we try to split all the processing in small chunks of, like a scheduler. So we are trying never, we are never blocking. So I also will go the question, how do we handle the buffers in the file system? Because that also is tricky. When you write to the file system, uh, you can do it safety or not safety. Not safety is more, is faster. For us, for example, we handle all the buffer in the file system. We use MMAP, and with MMAP, you can decide from your configuration if you want to synchronize everything or just let the kernel handle all the flashing for you. Most of people go with that mode, will be MMAP async, asynchronous, but if you want to be safe, you have to use the synchronous method, but there's a performance penalty. Okay, thank you so much. We uh, might leave it at that. If you could just put your hands together, please, to thank uh, for the great talk. Thank you.